um, from 0 to L. Correct? Yeah. You remember this? Okay, let's uh, review this one more time. What is N of X? The internal force, yeah. What is A of X? That's the cross section area. And then E of X? Okay. And then you just integrate that over the entire length, right? So what was the trick with method of sections to, to simplify this integration, right? Integration, you know, is more difficult. So what do we do here? So the areas that have a, a sections that have a constant area, a constant force, and a constant uh oh, this modulus meaning they have a constant elasticity can be uh, calculated with a simple uh, formula NL driver A. Okay, good. Great. And I don't want you to memorize that again, right? If you look at this this integral, you see if n of x is a constant number, it just pops out of the integral, right? If A of X is constant, the cross section is constant, at least in a section, right? You can take that out. And then E of X is section. Does that make sense? So that's why we turn to the method of sections. And there we say, OK, as long as the internal force or this section is constant, area is constant, I don't know, uh, elastic modulus is constant, I can simplify this equation into what again? So let's say N. A, E comes out, and then I'm left with the integral of dx, correct, over whatever, 0 to L. And this is, you just write that NL over AT, right? This is our go-to formulation, as long as everything is constant, yeah? Now, the L in this case that we have pertains to what? What's the L? Is it the total length of the bar? Length of section. Length of section. So A, so from A to B, for example, you have a constant uh, internal force. You have all of those, right? A is constant. B is constant. Does that make sense? Again, from B to C, and then C to D. So in a way, you kind of divide this problem into three smaller sections, and then. Uh, somebody said method of uh, su superposition, right? You just sum them up to get that information. Does that make sense? That's essentially what you need to do for any problem that is related to axial information. Okay? So first thing, you draw your free body diagram for that uh, particular section. And um, you have the forces, you have the internal forces, you, I guess, calculate the internal forces uh, from, uh, what's it called? The equilibrium, right? That equilibrium. Uh, so force is equal to zero, and the rest of it is just, you know, you plug them into that. Does that make sense? Right? Hopefully you can look at the video and, and that helps you again. Now, last time I got a question about that L again. So let's say I'm interested in section CD, right? Or section BC. Doesn't matter for one of those sections. What is the L that I put in, in that equation? Is it okay? Um, I think uh, this this um, diagram by, uh, by the book was a little confusing for some people, right? Let's say we're interested in the BC section, the middle one there, right? BC section. What is the length? What is that L that we put in that? What is it? One, right? Not two point five. Yeah. Um, so the book is saying, okay, I start from point B and then go all the way to B to find the internal force there. That's fine. Um, the way I said it in the, the video, I said, okay, I, I just have the section BC. I know what the internal force at C was, so I already have that information. I just find what happens at B. Okay. Um, either way, you should get the same answer because this is an equilibrium. Okay, but the important part is that L up there is going to be the length of BC. Okay, not the total length. Of Does that make sense? So um, if you um, made a calculation and the uh, value, I don't remember what the value here was, but this is an example from the book, right? 
So if your value is not correct, be sure you look at your value. Okay? Any questions about this? Again, you'll, you'll see this in the exam. Okay, so fair warning. Um, all right. Good. There was another uh, important part here in, in this uh, chapter, and that was uh, for indeterminate problems, right? So let's say we have uh, the column on, on the left from A to B is fixed at point A and at point B, right? So what's uh, so interesting about this problem? It's static. It's statically indeterminate. Statically indeterminate, right? Why is that? We have two unknowns in one frame. You have two unknowns, which are what again? Uh, reaction at A and reaction at C. Exactly, the reaction at A and reaction at B. We don't, we don't know. We have two unknowns, right? Um, but we have a single equation, which is sum f of y is zero. Balance of force in the y direction, right? So how do you go about solving this problem? <coughs> okay. Okay. So so what were the th three things that we thought about here? Well, one of them is the um, equation of uh, balance of forces, right? That's that's one, right? That's equilibrium. We have two two other things that we keep in mind solving a problem like this. What were they? Remember? Well, one of them is geometric, right? We call it kinematic constraint. Geometric. What what is that? Does that ring a bell? What do we know about A and B? A and B are fixed, right? So the total length of this column should stay the same, right? In, in theory, let's say, let's assume for a second we didn't have B here, right? What would happen? Would that apply force B? It would elongate, right? That, that uh, column would, would elongate because of the force uh, we have uh, intention, right? Does that make sense? But since it is fixed uh, at the top and bottom, it doesn't have uh, anywhere to form. So what happens there? At least in total length, that is. So then, that's our second equation, right? We say the total change in length should be zero, right? And then we have one more piece of information, which I keep referring to as the most important thing you learn in this class, which is what? The relation between stress and strength, right? We know the material, um, so we know with a certain applied force how much deformation you can expect, right? These are your, your three kind of uh, equations. So, uh, again, um, now let's force is a zero, so that's one equation. A and B are fixed, so the total length in, uh, in, in this member should be zero. Total change of length, right? So the length remains the same. And then uh, lastly, we know the correlation between force and deformation, right? That's all the information that you need to know. Now, um, as we were saying, this method of force is okay. We assume there is no B, right? For a second, we say, let's say there's no B there, and if that is the case, given this applied load P here, we should expect a delta P um, down here, right? We expect that, that uh, member to elongate at the bottom, right? So, again, we call this a redundant. Um, support because we don't need it uh, over uh, uh, the problem. So, so let's say we remove that. Again, we have a imaginary, I guess, um, elongation in, in the map, right? 
call it delta p. So far, so good, right? So, so we know the internal forces. We know delta p equals n l over a e, right? All of that. Um, so we calculate it okay, in delta p. So good. What's next? Then you have to uh, apply. extra length, and it's like how much force does it take to put it back? Um, and that's how you get F of V? Yes. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And, this, and F of A is just, after you get F of B, then you can kind of solve for F of A. Exactly. Okay. Um, there is um, more than a couple examples in the book. Definitely try to solve those on your own and see. Change the length should be the same, right? It goes to zero, yeah. You mean, you mean these two, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. And then we had, um, this is also a, another problem from the book. Um, this is one of the examples of the book, where it's a little more interesting, right? So here we have a 0.2 millimeter gap. Right? So, it's, if, if you look at it, right, it's the same as the previous example, right? These two are more or less one and the same, except that uh, uh, little gap at the end, right? Do you see that these two problems are the same? I mean, yes, one is vertical, one is horizontal, but we don't really care about that, right? It's the same idea, um, apart from, like I said, that little gap that we have there, okay? So, so there is a extra kind of wrinkle to this problem. There's an extra step that you need to take, and that is what that um, <clears throat> that delta p that you had here, right? 0.2 millimeter of it will face no resistance, right? So it elongates for 0.2 millimeters until it reaches that point B prime, and that's where you start having the, the reaction. Yeah, you see how, how that's more difficult now, right? So whatever, um, again, I mean, the, the idea is the same. You remove this redundant <coughs> reaction, assume it's not there. You apply uh, uh, force P 20 kilonewtons in the middle. You calculate the amount of elongation, right? That elongation is more than 0.2 millimeters, let's say. I mean, it will. So if it's more than 0.2 uh, two millimeters, how much of it do you think will, will kind of cause a, a reaction at B prime? So let's say it elongates for 0.5 millimeters. So you just subtract that, right? So 0.2 millimeters, there's no uh, reaction. 
after it touches point B prime, that's where your, your reaction force is swing in, right? So, so you need to kind of take that into consideration. The rest of it is pretty much the same as that last problem. Okay.
to be here on time. If you're late, you'll lose the time because we have to, you know, get out of here on time for the, the next class. Um, what else? Um, and then, uh, yeah. Solutions? No, but we. I mean, uh, we uh, we um, ask your TA for for the um, <coughs> solutions in this question. He uh, he should be able to help with that. Okay. Um, and again, those are from from the book too. You know, it's it's not. I I, did, I you know I'm not uh, planning to kind of make it make your life difficult. It's just you, know, you have to know these problems. So it's very similar to what you see in the book. Um, but again, okay, so, so you have about uh, two weeks, like, you know, less than two weeks, I guess, till the exam. If you try to solve something, you run into problems, come and ask, okay, or, or your team. Obviously not Tuesday of next week at 9 p.m. I won't be able to help you then, like, but, you know, before then, you know, you're welcome to ask questions, okay? <coughs> you're yeah. in yeah, All right. Should we start with new stuff? Oh, and the other thing is, I think I, I put it in the announcement. Um, you know, the origin stuff will be in the exam, right? So bending, we might start, but it's not part of your uh, exam. Okay. Yeah. For a problem like this, would we apply the force method that we just learned? Problem like this? Yeah, even though even though it yeah. doesn't like, even though it's not statically indeterminate until it closes the gap, um, would you kind of do like a multi-part like oh like it, you stretch it out this much and then you know would it stretch a little bit more? It, it, you yeah. Know? Okay. So you, you would chunk it out. Exactly. That's exactly what you mean. Okay. You know, up up to point two millimeters, it's as if it uh, you know uh, point P prime doesn't even exist, right? Because yeah. Up until that point, um, uh, this bar doesn't even recognize that it's there. Right? Mm -hmm. It's at that point where you have a resistance for uh, you know elongation. You have resistance, uh, aka the reaction force. Okay. All right. So. So let's talk about Torian. And you remember this from before, right? Um, this um, is a general, you know, uh, state of floating on an object, right? So, so whatever the thing is, we don't know. But in general, this is what's going to happen. So we have multiple external forces, reaction forces, you know, all, all those things. But as soon as we make a uh, cross-section cut, right, what do we expect to see there? We've had this a couple times so far. What do we expect to see on that uh, section? Yes, but you got more than that, right? Okay, so in general, you will have a uh, vector of force, right? Which, oops. Uh, you will have a vector of force, right? A resultant force, Fr, which, again, like, like I said, as the, in the general case, you know, it's, it has some angle, right? Don't know the angle, it has some angle there. So it's FR, and then you have a moment vector, correct? And that also has a, you know, whatever angle that is. Um, kind of a basic question. I know you all know, know the answer to this, but let me just uh, reiterate that. So the force. Force vector, you know, when you have that vector there, it's applying force, it's, it's pulling on, on that point A. Yeah, that's easy. What happens when, when we have a vector, uh, moment vector like that? What does that mean? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. In that direction, he's like twist around and axis and that mm. direction. That's better. Cross product, yeah. So no, you know, forget about the mathematics of it. Yes, that's correct. But like, what is it actually doing there? Like intuitively. So the force is easy, right? It's just pulling on that. According to that arrow there. But what about the moment? Are you all kind of able to visualize this? What's happening? So for the moment, you know, your right thumb would be in the direction of the arrow. And the four fingers are the direction of rotation, whatever that is, right? So it's kind of bending, rotating, twisting, you know, all of those in that direction. Does that make sense? Yes, it is a vector, just like FR, but they have totally different kind of concepts. Yeah? Does that, does that make sense? Should I repeat that? So, one more time. So if you know, right hand rule, right? If, if that is FRO, that's the direction, this will be the kind of direction of action, right? It's kind of rotating in that, that uh, direction. Okay, do we have a question somewhere there? Do you have a question? No? Good. Okay. All right. So, now that we put it into concepts of vectors, we have components to these vectors, right? And like always, the most important kind of separation of these components is what? One is normal or perpendicular to that uh, cross section, right? Which is, in the case of the force, is, is which one? Normal, we call it N, right? Normal. And then there is shear, which is tangent to that surface, right? Uh, and we call that shear, force, or V, okay? Um, which is this guy right here. Now, um, in a 3D world, how many axes do we have? Three axes. So N would be in the direction of, let's call it the Z axis. Doesn't have to be Z, but let's call that Z. And then V is what? V is along which axis? V is along which axis? This is a trick question. It's going to be X or Y. X or Y, Y, X, none of them are the right answer. It will have what? V is in a general direction, right? Does it have to be X or Y? In the X, Y plane, exactly, right? It has components in both X and Y in general. Let me draw this. I know I confuse you, but you should be able to answer this question. So let's say this is x and this is y, right? x, y, z. First of all, is this x and y or is this y and x? Did I, did I label the axis correctly? x, y, z or is it x, y, z? That is a true question. Well, you should answer this question directly, right? Tell me. Uh, I think so, because with the right hand rule. I think so what? Uh, there were two options. X, Y, yes. correct? You're saying it's correct? Correct is the right hand rule. Do you all agree with this? Yeah. yeah. Yes? More confident, please. Yeah. Why is this X, Y, and Z? Because the right hand rule. Right hand. So, so you go from X to Y, this would be Z, right? Yes. If it's the other way around, Z would be pointing downward. Yeah? Do you all see that? Yes? Yes. Good. All right, so now we have X and Y on the plane, right? And then Z is the normal. So where does V go? The, shears, the shear force is in which direction? Well, the right answer is it has components in both of them, right? So, so we have V of X and V of Y. Yeah. I know you all know this, but I wanted to just kind of um, go through that one time. Does that make sense? So in the general state of loading, we have three force components, because it's a 3D 
you wrong. One is normal, two are shear. Right? You can you can represent that by a tangent uh, um, v uh, vector, but that has information about both x and y. Okay. Now about the uh, uh, moment vector. What about that one? Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll say the easy, uh, easy part. We have a normal uh, moment, which we call T here, and that is perpendicular to that uh, cross-section area, uh, area, right? T is going up in the Z direction, okay? So, and we call it torsional moment. Why, why is that called torsional? What kind of action does it uh, apply around the torso. Around the, the torso. Like the, uh, the okay. Around the uh, axis, around the uh, area, the cross section of the area. Okay. What, what did you say? Like twisting. twisting. I think twisting is a good word, right? It's twisting this whole thing. Again, you know, this is uh, uh, the vector t, meaning it's applying rotation. Uh, counterclockwise, but but along that plane, right? So along that plane. So um, you know, it's um, let's see, right? So I want to open the lid here. What do I do? That's exactly what's happening, right? That's uh, M Z or whatever T you call it, right? It's twisting. So it's in this plane, right? The vector of it is is one. So. Um, that's the torsional moment, and it twists. And what about M here? First of all, is M along X or Y? It's so oh, yeah. Right? It, it's tangent to that plane, and it has both X and Y components. Yeah? Okay, you see that here now. But it is called bending moment. What, what's the difference? Why is this one bending and that one is torsion? Because it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's twisting around uh, per, at an area that you are to the area causing like a, a bending or Yeah, right, so, so the name hopefully helps you, right? So, so this is the same, same uh, object. Bending is now, you know, some, something like that. So it's kind of bending this, right, rather than twisting. Uh, that we had in the original uh, uh, moment up there. <coughs> okay? Does that make sense? And bending is, is its own uh, whole concept. Hopefully you can you can see torsion. Is that more similar to torsional moment? Is that more similar to normal forces or shear forces? What do you think? Torsional moment, is that more similar to normal forces or shear forces? Okay, some say normal, some say shear. Why normal? Somebody who said normal. Why normal? Because uh, they are both uh, they are both normal to cross sectional area, and they uh, okay. Normal to the cross section area. Okay, why shear? Somebody said shear. Why shear? Um, I think you could uh, you can see it as it forces touching on the plane, which causes it for the moment. Okay, good. So so we have two completely kind of op uh, opposite answers. Which one is the correct one? Let's do this one more time. The arrow is pointing upwards. Yes. Meaning, what's the what's the action that is applying? What's the rotation? It's this, right? I know the arrow, the way we represent it there, is normal, but the force is what? Is it in the x y plane? Do you all see that, right? Um, so one more time, is the torsional moment what it applies? Is it more similar to a shear force? Or a normal force? Shear force. Shear. Very good. Very good. Right? And everybody sees that? Is there someone who doesn't see it yet? Right? Again, don't get confused by the direction the arrow is pointing. 
that's for, for the moment, the arrow is that way, but the uh, you know, kind of action, the, the force that it's applying is kind of around that axis. Okay? Let me ask you one more question. Um, bending moment. Is bending moment more similar to a, a normal force or a shear force? Shear. Oh. <coughs> normal shear? Normal. normal force or shear force? Normal force, why? I feel like if, if it were a break, it would like the entire the planes would separate, so it would be normal. Right. So if I have so so this is the uh, let's say axis of the bending moment, right? That means my four four fingers would, would be showing the direction of rotation, right? So let's say this plane, I'm applying this force on it. Does it kind of visually make sense that I'm pulling this part up and pushing that part down, right? Yeah. Do, you, do you see that? I'm trying to make it like visually uh, kind of understandable for you, not just mathematically. So how is the bending moment in the X one? Right? You were what? If you could clarify how the bending moment is in the X one. Okay. So let's take a step back. We have that. Uh, red arrow MRO, right? That's the resultant moment around point O. Okay? In, in, in general, it's pointing somewhere in the space, right? In the 3D world, it's, it's pointing in that direction, right? And we know that that will have a normal component, which we call T here, right? And a shear component, which is on this plane, right? And we just call that the XY plane. We make the cut on the XY plane, and the normal is Z, correct? So, so that component is called T. The shear, the, the component that is tangent to this plane XY, we call it bending moment. So far, so good? Yeah. OK. So then the question is, why is it normal? Why, why is it applying normal force, right? All right. Let me, let me uh, talk about that torsional moment first one more time. So torsional moment. That's the direction of the arrow, right? In the z direction. And the rotation is going to be around that z axis. In other words, in the xy plane, right? Um, whereas the bending moment, the, the axis is, you know, in, in this plane, tangent, meaning the rotation would be around that axis and out of plane, right? So, so if I were to apply this, for example, here, you would see this region maybe kind of going upward, the region behind going downward, right? So that's more similar to a the effect of a normal force. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Everyone, good. I think this is important. It's it's basic, but it's important because that's that's where you. Um, kind of can, can differentiate these, right? And the same way we talk about normal forces and then shear forces, here we will talk about torsional moments and bending moments separately, right? And starting with, with torsional moments, uh, hopefully uh, that helps. Now, uh, a few examples. What What's a good example? I mean, I, I put a few up here, but maybe you have better examples in here. Uh, what's, what's a good example of where you see torsional moments in action? Hmm? Well, I mean, all of these are examples, right? So, so what's happening here? Right, it's it's going uh, downward and it's rotating. It's uh, you know kind of making a hole in, in the ground, right? The bit will um, experience twisting, twisting, or uh, another word for twisting is a torsional moment, right? Um, same thing for, you know, when we have the power transmission, right? So, so the shaft will, you know, actually this, this torsional force, uh, you know, relates to shafts uh, and design of shafts a lot, you know. Uh, that's, that's where you see a, a lot of that concept. Um, you know, so, so I think all of these are, are good examples for when um, we see this type of uh, force and any, any other good examples you might have in mind? 
I mean, this is pretty clear where you should expect this, right? Okay. Good. So, now let's uh, try to put what, what I said in words into kind of some, some mathematical uh, formula and some nice pictures. So we have uh, that um, uh, member on the left, right, uh, before deformation, right? Looks nice and simple, all those grid, grid lines are straight, right? The, the uh, lines, all of those lines are all straight, uh, and so on and so forth, right? And then we apply some torsional moment, right? Or you might have heard of uh, this is torque, right? So we apply some torque on this, um, on the two ends. So what happens? What do, you, what do you see here that's different? The lines are really straight, but they're no longer uh, 90 degrees mm -hmm. to the uh, surface area. You can slice, they're no longer 90 degrees to the high star. Right, very good. So, you know, the lines here, um, are straight and Kind of perpendicular to the cross section to each of these cross sections, right? Wherever you, you make a cross section perpendicular to the axis, you will have these lines perpendicular as well. That is different in, in the right picture, right? You hopefully you can see the lines are twisting at an angle. Right? It's still, at least we assume it to be straight, right? and for small deformations it's uh, straight, but you have an end, right, if you compare it to the, the right from uh, the left. So these longitudinal lines become twisted, and that's the work of a torsional moment. Right? So you have a torsional moment at the two ends, um, Torsional moment at two ends, and you see this twisting. What's the what's the vector, the arrow for for the t torsional moment here? <coughs> this is where you talk about clockwise and half clockwise. Where is it located? The the arrows. Is it that way or that way? Why? Can you focus at that end right here? It's going out. Huh? Um, is, it, is it going that way or that way? Is the question basically, right? So it's going that way, right now. That's the thing. Right. Right. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's twisting. Clockwise, yeah. Um, or the, the you know kind of arrow is, is pointing pointing outward. Uh, if you look at that. One. Now um, we we like like always we have a couple of uh, assumptions that we make. One is that well each of these planes were were flat plane, right? We assume that that still remains the case. So if I if I make a cut. On, on any of these kind of circumferential uh, lines, I'll still have that same plane flat. So it doesn't twist out of uh, out of plane. Okay? Just to make it uh, simpler. That's one. And then, you know, the, the, the other assumption you know already. What is the other assumption? <clears throat> Can it be a large angle or a small angle? Right? Always we, we are interested in small deformations for the most part, at least in this class. Um, so we assume that the angle is small enough for this to remain elastic. You, you, you still know what elastic means, right? What was elastic? Not plastic. Not plastic. Okay, that's good. So what is plastic? Permanent. Permanent deformation. So if you remove the force, it doesn't go back. It's, you know, that's the definition of plastic. 
right? Um, elastic means you remove the force, it will go back to its uh, original shape. Okay? Um, so in other words, you know, the, the radial lines remain the same, the radius remains the same. What happens is you have a twisting, so those uh, you know, kind of lines through the lines, those are the ones that change. And, you know, I'm sure you've seen examples of this uh, everywhere, but this is a good one. So we have a, um, you know, this is a, a, a rubber uh, cylinder, let's say, so it's kind of highly um, deformable. And we have a simple square, the, the white square in the middle, before the formation. And then you twist it, you apply torque into it, and what happens is that. You, know, you can see that the, the two vertical lines remain kind of the same, but you have a parallelogram now, where the last two lines are kind of angle. And that's, that's your angle of twist. We'll talk about angle of twist. Um, you know. But, um, so far so good? Any questions? All right, so let's do a quick uh, kind of dive into the formula. Read the book, you know, if you have any questions about how to derive this formula, let me know. You know, I'll, I'll uh, go through it quickly in order to kind of try to solve a, an example problem. So let's say the shaft is fixed on the uh, far end, right? And then we apply the twisting moment, the um, original moment here at this end. Is that different from twisting it from the two ends? Yes? Why? How is that different? Well, okay, what is that uh, fixed support do at the end? Does it apply in the reaction force or reaction moment? I guess? Opposite? So is that the same? I, I didn't read the question. Is that the same as putting two original uh, uh, moments T at, at the two ends? Yes. You say yes again? So, so what do I do if I have that support at the end, right now? What's the value of the reaction? T. The reaction moment. It's going to be T, right? In the opposite direction. So what is the difference between that and just putting two T's, one here, one here? No. No difference, right? Yes. Yeah. Did I confuse you? <laughs> All right, it doesn't matter, right? So, you know, if, if I have a T moment here and a T moment there, um, like this example. Sorry, sorry. This on the right and this are one and the same. Yeah. Deformation lines would be different, yes, but uh, it's, if if you keep that. Uh, you know, kind of constant, you see all the information here, right? It's, it's like the whole thing rotates. But mathematically, it doesn't matter. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, so so we have a uh, radial line, right? And when you say radial line, these are what you're referring to, right? From the uh, center, going outward uh, towards the uh, outer uh, periphery of that. Uh, sir, right? So let's say we, we have one of these sections here at this this x from the fixed end, right? And if you look at it, there, there will be a, a twist of angle phi, there, let's say, right? And this phi obviously is a function of X. Yeah, you can clearly see that. So if you follow that same line, you see the angle increases as we get farther, right? So, so this is the angle. Um, the angle of twist uh, is. Uh, Wait, if you say angle increases or decreases, it decreases. So, so this is a general, I guess, case, right? It could be at either, right? Um, the angle for, for this case um, is so, so the angle that you have there, the amount of information there is bigger, right? 
the rotation fields. Um, so it depends on position x. You know, that's that's our general case, always always like that. And uh, you know, if you um, look at a small disk there at that position x, like this, right? So we have um, let's call that the you know the front face and the back face. There is going to be a difference between the front face and the back face in terms of the amount of rotation, correct? Right? And um, let's call that difference the <coughs> phi. Okay. Um, and you can show. Oh. Um, I uh, kind of uh, uh, gave a uh, you know representation of this in the video also under the, the book. So I won't go through all of that here, just, just to, so we have some time to do a, a problem. But uh, if you look at this small disk, right, because of that uh, torsional um, moment, or that torque, um, you see there's a little bit of difference between the front face and the back face here. Uh, and we call that uh, so here, uh, let's say we have phi of x plus phi there, and then the back, is, the back face that back here we have just phi of x. Okay. Um, now, from before, you know if there is a change in angle, what's that called? Delta. Think strain. What type of strain was that? So call that shear strain, right? So if you have um, a, let's say the disc, you know, had no deformation, and now the front face is rotating a, a tiny bit more than the back face, right? And that constitutes some shear strain. Okay. So that shear strain we still show show by gamma, um, gamma right here. Right, so that's that's the uh, uh, amount of uh, shear strain that you have uh, uh, in that location, right? At radius rho from the center, right? So one more time, if you're at the center, how much shear strain do you you expect? Zero. That's actually an interesting question. So. If you have a you know cylinder shaft and then you twist it at the two ends, right? You can see on the surface of it there is some deformation, right? You remember those uh, longitudinal lines, right? There is some deformation, but do you expect that deformation to increase, decrease, remain the same as you go from the surface down to the center of the shaft? Decrease. Decrease. decrease uh, uh, we see that, right? At the center, what's that deformation? Zero. It's going to be zero, right? That's the neutral axis, actually. So you, you twist it, there's twist on the surface, but then as you go closer to the center, that twist, that shear strain, would go down and all, uh, uh, all the way to zero at the center. Yeah? So can you see clearly that that is a function of how far you are from the center? Yes. Yes. So is our road the distance from the center to like the yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, yeah. Right. It's small enough. Okay. That's a, a you know tiny differential element. It's small enough that you assume the, the radius is the same for Okay. Wait. What? Yeah, it's kind of tough uh, to do that here. Um, so, but yes, the max of uh, shear strain of uh, gamma, it's from, uh, if I'm looking at it correctly, it's, it's from the start of the strain to the end, like uh, from the, the, uh, um, the, the, from the black, from the uh, darkened, uh, uh, so think about it this way, you have a cylinder, right? This, this part of it is fixed, this part you're twisting, right? You agree that at, at the support, all the way to the end of 
the, uh, uh, the chat, there is no angle. It remains the same. Right? That doesn't move. As you get farther and farther away from it, though, you have some twisting. Right? And the biggest amount of twisting is at the free end. At the free end. Right? I'm, go I'm going axially. Right? Longitudinal. Right? So if I take now a disk in the middle, right? Does it make sense that the face of that disk that's closer to the wall has a tiny bit smaller twisting than the other face that is closer to the free end? Yes. Right? And that's what's happening. We call that DP here. Right? That's the small change in uh, rotation from the back face to the front face. Okay? Yeah, I know it's, it's kind of tough to, to draw these three uh, you know, visualizations, but uh, bear with me. And then, since there is a difference in angle of twist, we have shear strength. Okay, that makes sense. Now, on this plane, we have shear strength, but that shear strength is a function of the radial distance, how far you are from the center. Right? Hopefully that also makes sense. Okay. And um, so you will have, if you write up the equations, and hopefully you will on your own, you will have gamma equal rho divided by C some gamma max. What is gamma max? Gamma max is the amount of shear strain. This is gamma max. It's the amount of shear strain at where does gamma max happen? At the surface, right? At, at uh, the farthest you are from the center, you have your maximum shear strain. We we'll talked about that. And then at the center, you have zero. And then in between those. Uh, you have some amount, and that is a function of this row. Correct? And, I mean, you can, you can show that this is linearly related. So, um, rho is the radial distance of where you're interested in. C is the radius of the shaft. And uh, that ratio times gamma max gives you the, the gamma that you have each uh, radial. Okay, so far so good. So, yeah, in other words, the shear strain that we have in the shaft uh, in each of these cross sections, it varies linearly uh, along the, the radial line. Again, from zero to a maximum gamma max value of something. Okay? So keep that in mind. Now, uh, we have gamma, which was shear strain. How do we go from shear strain to shear stress? Anyone? We have shear strain, let's say. We have an idea of it, right? Where do you go from there to shear stress? You do like shear stress. Okay, young right idea, but not young modulus, right? Did someone say shear modulus? Shear. Shear modulus, right? So you have shear strain, you multiply that by the shear modulus, you get shear stress. Yeah, the same way you had uh, uh, normal strain, you multiply that by Young's modulus, you get normal stress. The same uh, works for shear stress, but we, we have a shear modulus. And uh, we usually use G to kind of uh, represent shear modulus. And tau, tau is what? Shear stress equals G shear modulus times gamma. Yeah, so let me write this here. So this is shear stress. This is shear modulus. What is the um, unit of shear modulus? Shear 
Sure modulus. Okay, look at that equation that's coming. Sure stress. Shear stress is stress, yes, Pascal's. Uh, shear stress is shear stress, so that's Pascal's. Strain is dimensional S, so the mod modulus it should be. Thank you. All right. So, again, um, we, we know for, uh, for a fact that uh, you know, shear strain is zero right in the center axis. It's uh, on the center is zero, and is maximal on the farthest most on the uh, on the, the surface of the shaft. Uh, how about shear stress? Going up. You're going down. What's the value of shear stress right in the middle? Zero. Zero, right? Zero. So multiply zero by some g, it's, it's going to give you zero still, right? And the maximum surface. It's going to be at the surface. Right, um, so so you can you can write this as well. Um, tau equals some rho over c, like like we had in the previous slide. Some tau max, max uh, you know tau max is on and then that also increases from zero. If you if you draw a linear line, it, it goes from zero all the way to a maximum value. Right? So that's also a linear increase in the map. Right? And the way you... Now, you have tau. Tau is what again? Is sheer stress. Right? Stress is, is what again? F over A. Remember that, that formula? Um, it's force over area, right? So you're, you're looking at each specific area of this and uh, saying, okay, the amount of stress is that. What if, what if I want to know the amount of the total force or the total shear force that's there? Does it make sense to add it all up, right? So, so you just add them, or in other words, integrate, right? So uh, a T, which is our uh, torque or, or um, original moment right here um, is going to be uh, the integral over A of rho tau dA, because tau dA is, is the amount of uh, shear uh, force, tau is the shear stress, you multiply by the uh, differential area, so that, that's going to be the F, basically. That's the force, and you multiply by rho to get uh, yes. What does rho stand for? Rho is the uh, uh, good question. Rho is the radius. Radius from where? For, exactly. So wherever you want to be, that's the radius. Okay. So in this case, you said from where, right? From the center of the shaft. So this is rho here. Rho goes from zero to c. Okay, I think I had a better picture here. This is C, radius of the shaft. Okay, and rho is just representative of radial distance, right? So it could be from zero all the way to C. This is some arbitrary position. Right? And the rho is like x in your uh, Cartesian coordinates. Rho is well, no, no, no. So you, you need to go from, you know, you, rho is a kind of variable from 0 to c. It's like x, right? If, you, if you're, the length is l, you change x from 0 to l to sweep, right? Rho is like that, but what is the radio? Yeah. Are you? How do you integrate? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so this is the integral that we have over the area, and then you can write um, dA uh, depending on what you have. Okay. So, for example, actually, that's a good uh, kind of segue to this next slide. So, let's say we have a uh, you know area element. Let's start with green here. What's the area there? What's dA? 
in that uh -huh. DA is you're integrating over an area, right? DA.
encapsulate this because that's a geometric function, right? So if you know it's a cylinder with such and such radius, you do the interjection, you get that, you know your t, that's how you uh, calculate your tau max. You know the max value of shear stress in the shaft. And once you have the max value, you can, you can just put it in here and then calculate the shear stress at any given point. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what is like the high level definition of polar moment of inertia? Polar moment of inertia? That's a good question actually. Uh, do you know what moment of inertia is? Yeah. What is moment of inertia? Like if like a spinning body like has like Yeah, like say energy it's storage. dynamics, right? What was, what was the formulation again? Um, the mm -hmm. Good. I'll give, I'll give you a, um, um, what's the word? Unofficial definition here, right? Hopefully this makes you uh, understand something better. But that's not how you get the definition. So F equals MA, right? What's M doing there? Huh? Good. M is the mass, right? So if we, um, that's a that's a good, good answer. It's resisting acceleration, right? So M is resisting acceleration. So if you have a bigger M, that means for the same force you have less acceleration, right? It's kind of resisting acceleration. Now F equals M A is for linear motion, right? What's the rotational motion? I uh, 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 T or M whatever equals I alpha, right? Alpha was what? Angular acceleration. Angular acceleration. You have the torque, right? The, the rotational force. And then I is doing what? I is your moment of inertia, correct? So what is I doing there? That's resisting angular acceleration, okay? So if you have a bigger mass, right? If it's kind of, it has a big radius, that rotational acceleration is resistant. Okay? So keep this in mind. Now here, polar moment of inertia, so that was moment of inertia. Now polar moment of inertia is kind of similar to that, right? It's resisting, we don't have acceleration here anymore, right? What's the idea that we're, we're doing? Twisting, right? Deformation, right? So if I tell you um, the Young's modulus is really high, What's happening there? It's resisting. For Young's modulus, is resisting normal strain, Young's modulus, right? Shear strain, shear, shear modulus is resisting uh, shear deformation, and polar moment of inertia is resisting what? Twisting, right? It's it's resisting that that. Uh, hopefully that, that kind of clarified it, right? So your moment of, uh, polar moment of inertia, if it's higher, you will get less of that uh, deformation. Does that help? Okay. All right. Uh, we ran out of time. So I wanted to do an example here, but uh, before you go, wait, where is that example? Here. Um, try to solve this example. You have uh, everything that you need to solve it, okay? So the difference is, on the left you have a solid shaft, and on the right you have a hollow shaft, a tubular uh, structure, right? For the same amount of 